Good day and welcome to Epstein Becker Green's webinar, Federal Government Contractors and Subcontractors, Compliance with the OFCCP's New Regulations under VEVRA and the Rehabilitation Act. We are pleased to have two fantastic speakers today, Epstein Becker Green's Peter Stein, who is a member of the firm's Labor and Employment Practice, and Dean Singwald, who is an associate in the firm's Labor and Employment and Litigation Practices. Before we begin today's presentation, please be informed that today's webinar is being recorded and the participant phone lines will be placed in listen-only mode throughout the program. You are welcome to submit questions throughout the program by using the Q&A feature provided by WebEx, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the program, with time permitting, the speakers will address your questions. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to the presenters following the webinar, and contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint materials. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Peter. Well, thank you, Kirsten. Thank you very much. To those of you who participated in our VEVRA update two weeks ago, welcome back. For those first timers, this is the second part of a two-part series addressing the changes made earlier this year to the regulations affecting the, both the Rehabilitation Act and the Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act, both of which apply only to certain government contractors and subcontractors and which require a subset of those employers, those with 50 or more employees and $50,000 in government business, by the way, $100,000 under VEVRA, to develop and maintain affirmative action plans. And today, my colleague, my esteemed colleague, Dean Singewald, and I will be specifically addressing the changes to the Rehabilitation Act regulation and what steps you should be considering taking to assure compliance with those regulations. As we are still in the month of October, I want to remind everyone that we are at the tail end of the National Disability Employment Awareness Month, supported by the United States Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, otherwise known as ODEP. If you click on the U.S. Department of Labor website and then go to the ODEP page, you will find helpful resources, helpful resource materials for employers, which use, and, and you'll see on that website, the catchwords, expect, employ, empower, what you can do. This is for National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And for we, each of the five weeks in October, yes, in October we had five work weeks, ODEP published a list of ideas and action items that employers could and can still undertake to encourage the employment of the disabled. And I suggest for those of you who are interested to check out that particular website, U.S. Department of Labor, and then click on to ODEP. There is little question that going forward, the OFCCP, the United States Department of Labor Agency responsible for affirmative action compliance, will be placing greater emphasis on contractors' compliance with both the veterans, both the VEVRA and the Rehabilitation Act regulations. As you will see in a few moments, a new scheduling letter published just weeks ago illustrates all too well this change in emphasis. I've been practicing in this affirmative action arena for over 30 years and uh, through perhaps scores of reviews. I've, been, I've done scores of compliance reviews. And whether by good lawyering or good luck, probably good luck more than anything else, I have found little emphasis placed on BEVRA and rehab regulations and compliance through these compliance reviews, with the exception, by the way, of the job posting requirement under VEVRA. Uh, in the face of compliance reviews, we would submit plans to the, to the government, and almost to a certainty, OFCCP would focus on 11246 compliance, that is for minorities and women, perhaps looking at hiring issues, promotion issues, 
uh, hiring data, promotion data, and more recently, uh, an emphasis on compensation issues and data, with very significantly less follow-up on BEVRA and Rehab Act compliance. The new scheduling letter changes all of that, where once there were 11 specific items to address in the itemized listing, there are now 22. And this first slide shows the specific items uh, requested regarding compliance with Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act. The cover letter in the scheduling letter remains essentially the same. That is, they request submission of this data within 30 days. And as an aside, I note that in a recent Daily Labor Report article, the director of the Southwest and Rocky Mountain region indicated that the national average response time was 48 days instead of the 30 days requested. The scheduling letter remains the same, but what is different is the itemized listing, which, as I said before, used to include eight specific, I'm sorry, 11 specific requests, and now partly in recognition of the new Weber and rehab regulations has doubled to 22. Two weeks ago, I addressed the expanded Weber requests, um, and on the slide below you, uh, you see the expanded rehab action, re rehab action, rehab act requests. So under the itemized listing for section 503, number seven, they want you to specifically evaluate the effectiveness of outreach and recruitment efforts that were intended to identify and recruit qualified individuals with disabilities. That's affirmative action. What efforts have you made? What outreach efforts have you made? What advocacy groups have you reached out to to recruit qualified individuals with dis disabilities? How have you cast the wider net? What have you done? Has it worked? What has worked? What hasn't worked? And both Dean and I will touch on later some of the, the examples of how you do that. They want a number eight, documentation of all actions taken to comply with the audit and reporting system requirements. Again, in both 11246, VEVR and Rehab, there's an audit reporting system requirement. They, this is a, to formalize uh, your affirmative action process. This regulation requires contractors to develop an audit reporting system to measure the effectiveness of your efforts. <clears throat> have you met your objectives? What have you done? What are the activities you, you've undertaken? How have they succeeded or not? And how have you followed those processes? They want documentation of the computations or comparisons of applicant and hiring data. And Dean will we'll chat later how you collect that information, but again, this is now the first time we'll be collecting applicant data on the disabled. Uh, they want it for the immediate preceding year, and if you're six months into the plan, when you get this scheduling letter, they want the information for at least the first six months of the current AAP year. So they want you to do an adverse, in fact, the applicant and, and hiring data really gives you information to do an adverse impact study. Are disabled individuals being hired at a rate appropriate based on your applicant flow? Finally, they ask for the utilization analysis. For the first time, as we'll get into later on, they want us to identify uh, disabled individuals in our workplace, and they have set a goal. And they have, and, and they have set a goal of seven percent utilization by job group. If you're less than a hundred employees by the entire workforce. Uh, this new scheduling letter can be found in OCP's website. Uh, currently under the latest event and news. Otherwise, if you send either Dean or I an email, we can forward the scheduling letter to you. But again, you can check the OFCCP's, OFCCP's homepage. On the right-hand column, it says latest uh, events and news, and you should be able to find the new scheduling letter. These revised regulations were effective March 24th. So we're seven, what, seven months into it now. Um, just want to remind you that only those plans prepared after March 24th um, need to be in compliance with these new regulations. 
If you had plans prepared prior to March 24th, that is in January, February, or earlier March, you can wait until the next annual cycle to come into compliance. But why are we, why are they doing this? Well, this is the first significant change since the, to the regulations since the 1970s. And I think it's fairly clear to all of us that the prior regulations were not sufficiently effective in improving the employment opportunities for the disabled. You know, notwithstanding the efforts uh, made by employers under the 1973 Re Rehabilitation Act or the 1993 ADA, uh, I think we all recognize that more can be accomplished in this arena, particularly with the employment of the disabled. You see some data points here. The median disabled household income is uh, only 25,000 versus 60, that close to 60,000, that's 2011 data. Uh, the mean disabled hourly wage is lower than the non-disabled hourly wage. Uh, the unemployment rate for disabled males runs 7.2% higher than, that's a plus 7.2%. And for disabled females, the unemployment rate's uh, plus 6.5%. On ODEP's webpage, they list the unemployment rate of people with disabilities as 12.3%, for people without disabilities at 5.5%. So it's twice as high, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities. It's a real social concern. Uh, I, I don't believe for a moment that it's with, with any malevolent intent, uh, but I believe that uh, as a society, uh, we continue to make unfair presumptions regarding the workplace abilities of the disabled. And because of those presumptions, uh, progress towards the goal of equal employment opportunities for the disabled has been slower uh, than we hoped. And that these regulations and the added scrutiny placed by the OFCCP during compliance reviews will hopefully and presumably add momentum to the drive to increase the employment of the disabled in our workplace, at least for the federal contracted community. Like the veterans regulations and like the executive order, it's really a process of social engineering. What can we do? What process can we put in place to encourage uh, the employment of the disabled. Uh, these regulations, Rehab Act regulations, apply to contracts of $10,000 or more. Uh, that is consistent with 11246, which is $10,000 or more. But just note, as we said in the VEVRA program, uh, the coverage for VEVRA is $100,000. The Equal Opportunity Clause, which exists, there's an Equal, equal Opportunity Clause under 11246, seven items, is an e Equal Opportunity Clause under VEVRO, there are 12 separate, 12 different items, and um, consistent with 11246, there are seven items under the Rehabilitation Act. Um, this clause is in effect in all government contracts. And it says that you will not discriminate against the disabled and you'll take affirmative action to attract, employ, and retain disabled individuals. What is specifically new, the EO, the EO, uh, EO clause hasn't changed um, uh, significantly uh, under the, the uh, VEBRA or Rehab Act, but they did add a new provision um, stating that the contractor must in all solicitations or ad advertisements for employees state affirmatively that all qualified applicants will, see, will receive consideration for employment and will not be discriminated against on the basis of disability. So as, as, a, as a contractual matter, a contractor has promised that in every, every it says all solicitations, all advertisements for employees, you will state that all qualified applicants will be considered and will not be discriminated against. Uh, this notice, by the way, has for years been required as part of 11246. EO clause in the regulations, um, and now it's been added to both the disabled and the vet regulations. It wasn't previously in the disabled and vet regulations. It was um, uh, optional in the earlier iterations. A, a major part of affirmative action, again, there's just two words, affirmative action, positive steps that you take to eliminate discrimination. But a major part of affirmative action is the marketing of it and pronouncing to prospective applicants as well as recruiters, 
that the disabled will be given a fair shake in employment consideration. <clears throat> it's interesting to note, just as an editorial note, because I studied both the Weber regs, Weber regs and the rehab regs, and there's a slight different take uh, in, this, in this provision in, under Weber than under the rehab. Um, in the Weber regs, it states that all qualified applicants will receive consideration without regard to their protected veteran status. That's all it says. Uh, here, the words, and not discriminated against, is added. Um, I'm not so sure I can tell you why that, why that distinction was made, but it exists. The concept, nonetheless, is the same for both non-discrimination and that everybody will be given a fair shake and will be considered for employment and not discriminated against. Uh, the full one through seven clause, the paragraphs one through seven of the EO clause, it's not necessary for that entire clause to be included verbatim in the, con in the contracts or subcontracts. And there's language, it must be bolded as you see. If you include it, it must be bolded as you see and contain the language set forth in this um, uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. I find it interesting, next slide is called prohibitions, where it says no reverse discrimination. Uh, I found it very interesting that there's this new section in the Rehab Act Regulation 741.21b, which specifically states, and it's worth reading to you for a moment, that, quote, nothing in this part shall provide the basis for a claim that an individual without a disability was subject to discrimination because of, of the lack of, di of a disability or because an individual with a disability was granted an accommodation that was denied to an individual without a disability. So they're saying, in a sense, there's no claim for reverse discrimination. They're saying that formally. Uh, such language, this language does not exist in either 11246 or its implementing regulations. In fact, such a, quote, reverse discrimination, I don't like the word reverse discrimination, it's just, it's just discrimination on the basis of race, color, creed, sex, national origin, but that's a phrase people have been using for years. Uh, under 11246 or under Title VII, a, a claim can exist, at least in the non-accommodation context, such as hiring, terminations, promotions, compensation. Uh, under Title VII principles, if you give a preference to a, uh, a minority or a female um, and you hire a minority female who's, who's less qualified than a, a, a white male, you can have, in a sense, a claim of discrimination. Um, and um, it's just, again, as I say, plain discrimination uh, based on race or sex. What's also intriguing is that these concepts are the same for protected veterans as on the rehab. Uh, that is, a person who's not a veteran uh, should not have a cause of action if a preference for, you know, for hiring promotion is provided to a protected veteran. Yet no such similar regulation that, that 741.21b is found in the Weber regs. And again, I can't figure that out why it's in the rehab regs and not in the Weber regs. On this affirmative action program slide, um, it's also interesting to note uh, that the following language appears in these rehab regs. Uh, and similar language appears in the 11246 regs, but not in the Weber regs. And that is they state that an affirmative action program is a management tool. And that's right. This is, it's your tool. It's employer's tool uh, that's designed to ensure equal employment opportunities and foster employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities. It institutionalizes the contractor's commitment to equality. It formalizes it. And it is more than a paperwork exercise. That's, that's very important because, unfortunately, too many employers, even affirmative action employers, federal government contractors, um, uh, I still, unfortunately, treat this as a paperwork exercise. Let's do the plan, put it on the shelf, uh, and, and be done with it. But it is more than a paperwork exercise. It is, and, and, and this is in a new phrase, it's not in 11246 the regs, it says, it is dynamic, it changes, and includes measurable objectives, quantitative analyses, and internal audit reporting systems, again, so you can see how you're doing, that measure the contractor's progress, 
towards achieving equal employment opportunity for individuals with disabilities. This statement or this sentiment is both accurate and appropriate. Dean, I'll pass over. We'll, we'll spend a couple of moments here talking about uh, the new posters. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Peter was just talking about uh, the obligation that the program has as a management tool uh, with you doing your affirmative action programming, using it as a management tool. The OSCCP wants to make sure that as a government contractor, you're taking those affirmative steps to ensure non-discrimination and equal opportunity for employment. And one of the ways in which they uh, that is accomplished, uh, as they see it, is by you posting the equal employment opportunity is the law poster. Now, this is not a new requirement uh, in, in your uh, bulletin boards uh, and where you post policies and notices throughout your workplace, you should have an equal employment opportunities law poster presently posted. But there are new requirements with these new regulations, which I thought was important to point out to you. So while in the past, as a government, federal government contractor or subcontractor, you agreed to post the notice in a conspicuous place, now you, you have an obligation to ensure that applicants or employees with disabilities are provided the notice in a form that is accessible and understandable. Uh, and what that means is, while well, you would traditionally have the, the notice, the poster available to employees as posted, if somebody comes to you and says, I need to see it in larger print, or I'm blind and I need to see a version in Braille, feel a version in Braille, uh, I'm in a wheelchair and can't see the, the poster because it's too high, I need it lower, those are all accommodations that you need to be providing to ensure that your employees or applicants have that opportunity to be able to read while present the poster, the Equal Opportunities to Law poster, which sets forth uh, as employers and federal government contractors the laws that are in place that protect employees. Now, the, the regulations go on because times have changed. And now there are people that are working from home, uh, that are working remotely. There are also application processes that are not being done by paper anymore, but rather being done like electronically online. So the regulations have been modified to adopt that, to recognize that, uh, and provide that for employees that work remotely, you still need to make that this poster accessible to them. You're either going to post it in a conspicuous place on your intranet, the company's intranet, or if you don't have that, you're going to be providing to your employees working remotely uh, the documentation via email. And that all assumes that the employees working remotely have access to computers and to your intranet or to your email communications uh, so that they're provided with that documentation. Now, going further, because of the fact that employers now are also uh, having their career web pages online and having uh, potential employees apply for positions online. Uh, they want to make that equal opportunities law poster available to applicants as well. So now you need to have an electronic posting, again, with your career web page so that when, employee, when applicants are applying for positions, they have that poster readily available. Now, you also have a requirement separate and apart from this equal employment opportunity as a law poster to provide a policy statement, which basically says you're a firm of action employer, you're not going to get, discriminate against individuals with disabilities. And that's a poster that needs to be, uh, uh, that statement needs to be included on your bulletin boards. Well, now again, that as well as the equal opportunities law poster needs to be electronically posted and available for employees and applicants. So with Peter talking about the importance of documentation, the new efforts by the OFCCP to ensure that contractors are meeting their obligations uh, as it relates to individuals with disabilities and protected veterans, you now have an obligation on your career page to post a link, to insert a link that would allow for applicants using your career pages uh, to uh, push the link and be able to have access to the equal opportunities to law poster or your equal opportunity policy. So I want to make that point to you because when the next compliance review comes down, 
Uh, don't be surprised if they ask for evidence of you having posted these on your links, on your career web page. Now, further keeping with the obligation to reach out to applicants, uh, the federal government wants to be able to understand just exactly how you're doing and how effective your outreach and recruitment efforts are. Uh, so they have, uh, in three instances, both at pre-offer, pre post-offer, and with your existing employees, having you invite your employees and applicants to self-identify whether they have a disability or not. Uh, now, as a, a note, uh, we do have the forms both for uh, to identify disability or protected veteran status, and we would be happy to provide those to you as well. Uh, those are available on the, on the web, um, um, but we are happy to provide them to you. As it, the form relates to individuals with disabilities, self-identifying the disability status, the federal government has taken an interesting approach, which is to mandate that the form prescribed by the Department of Labor be specifically used. Now, there is some ability for you to modify that form, in essence, to use it as a PDF or electronically, but the format, format the language, the fonts, the uh, officially um, uh, approved OMB control number, the date supplied, everything that's contained within the form needs to be uh, uh, part of the form that you use, and the, and the reason being is that they want applicants and employees, when being pre presented with this invitation, to understand that it's an officially approved government form that they're actually applying for. And I think the purpose behind that is they, the government is really interested in getting this information from individuals, and if the individuals understand and recognize that it's the form they're being provided comes from the federal government, that they may in indeed be more willing to voluntarily provide that information than not. Now, as I mentioned, you have to offer it. It's one form. It's not going to be modified. There are two forms, as we discussed uh, a couple weeks ago, as it relates to protected veterans. But for the individuals with disabilities invitation, you provide that form pre-offers to all your applicants so that you're able to track your numbers of those applying and assess the effectiveness of your outreach and recruitment. Then once you make an offer, and prior to that first day of employment, you need to provide uh, post-offer the same form uh, because now that the person has been hired, they may be inclined to uh, self-identify their disability status where they may not have been willing to do that when an applicant. In post offer, you're going to use that data uh, as part of your da data collection obligation and for performing a utilization analysis, which Peter will be talking about later in our program. Uh, but now, not only do you need to do this, uh, provide this invitation to self identify to applicants, but you need to do it to your employees. Uh, and if you have not done that since the regulations went into effect in March of this year, you need to do that now. And then once you've done that, every five years, uh, uh, you need to uh, resubmit the, the invitation to your employees, reissue it, to resurvey them, because circumstances for employees may change. And while today I may not have a disability, within five years I may. Uh, today I may have a disability that I'm not willing to uh, reveal. Five years from now uh, may be different, and maybe I'm in the need of an accommodation or whatnot. And so my circumstances have changed. The government wants to ensure that you're resurveying your workforce so you can capture those changes. Now, the information that's provided on the invitation uh, is going to be kept confidential. Uh, and while you may view it as medical information, if somebody is identifying that they have a disability, this will be kept separate and apart from the medical uh, files that you maintain. Uh, and you should note, uh, similar to uh, what's on the uh, protected veterans invitations, there is a clause that allows or advises applicants and employees that if they have a need for accommodation, that they should seek you out and let you know that. And then you'll have to engage in that process, and Peter will be able to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Now, why are you doing this invitation of self-identifying, collecting this data? because we have a data collection analysis opportunities. 
Um, bottom line is on an annual basis, you need to be collecting data and documenting it as to, in terms of the number of disabled applicants you have, the total number of applicants you have, the total number of disabled applicants that you hire, and the total number of applicants hired. And what you're effectively doing and able to do, although it's not a specific requirement with the OSCCP, is to look to see if there's adverse impact. And I believe that down the road that the government is going to be more inclined to, to make that an obligation on your part. So that's effectively, as we see it, what the data is it allows you to do. It allows you to do an impact ratio analysis where you're able to determine the percentage of disabled applicants who have been hired and compare that to the percentage of non-disabled applicants who have been hired. And where you then look at the two different percentages, if there's significant disparity between the two, then that suggests that there's adverse impact and you need to drill down to figure out how come we are hiring less disabled individuals than non-disabled individuals or vice versa uh, to ensure that everyone has equal employment opportunity. And again, when you collect this data and print it out, you're going to be able to use it. To, to, this is one measure that you're going to be able to use to determine the effectiveness of your outreach and recruitment efforts. And that data collection analysis is also used in terms of your audit reporting. Um, how, how are we doing? I think Mayor Koch used to walk around New York and say, how am I doing? Well, that's very much what affirmative action is about. How am I doing? How are we doing? What do those numbers look like? Are we, um, you know, is there any adverse impact on disabled applicants compared to the hiring of non-disabled applicants? And as Dean pointed out, you now have, it, per, previous to this, you never had the data. You weren't required to collect that data. Now you're required to collect the data. Now you can do an analysis. Uh, and if there is a disparity, that does disparity doesn't indicate discrimination necessarily. Uh, but it does, once you have that disparity, if you, again, as Dean pointed out, if you're hiring um, non-disabled uh, individuals at a, at a greater rate than disabled individuals, then that, you know, and you have that disparity, then a question should naturally be, how come? And why is that happening? Um, perhaps discrimination is in the offing. You need to correct that. But perhaps there's a rational reason. Maybe those disabled people really weren't qualified individuals with disabilities. They didn't have the physical or mental skills to do the job, perhaps because of their disability. You don't have to hire unqualified people. It only is applicable to qualified individuals with disabilities. But this gives you information. Now, the collection of this data is affirmative action. Analysis of this data is affirmative action. And doing something and, and, and drilling down if you have adverse impact is affirmative action. And then if you need to take a more affirmative steps, uh, such as training of your supervisor, your hiring manager, that's also affirmative action. This is all about what we can do to collect it, to analyze why we're impacting one group more than another. And we do, we've been doing that for years with regard to sex and minority status. And now for the first time, we'll be doing it also with disability status. So let's now talk about reasonable accommodations. Uh, you know, whether it's under the ADA or the Rehabilitation Act, a reasonable accommodation has and continues to be required. Uh, and um, in the regulations, uh, the um, OFCCP actually suggests um, the development and use of, this is now the last bullet, the development and use of written procedures for processing requests for reasonable accommodation, uh, but it's not mandated. They say it's a best practice. They certainly would like you to develop those procedures for how you deal with requests for reasonable accommodation. And uh, it's not new, but Appendix B to the regulations has always been a section called Developing Reasonable Accommodation Procedures. And it's a, um, a set of out, an outline of um, how companies can develop uh, written procedures to deal with a, a request for affirmative action. And while they say it's a best practice, uh, they're not mandating it. Uh, what is new, well, it's not new, but what's also interesting, I'm, I'm going to read you this section. I did this under Vevera because it still strikes me as being very intriguing. Um, uh, I want to talk about this uh, section 44D1. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's been the regulations uh, for 20 years, maybe 25 years. I can't go back and look at my files, see how long it's been there, but it's been there for quite some time. It's nothing new, but my experience tells me it's not being universally followed. Uh, it says, as a matter of affirmative action, this is now the first bullet, uh, if an employee with a known disability is having significant difficulty performing his or her job, and it is reasonable to conclude that the performance problem may be related to that known disability, the contractor shall, that's, that's an imperative, confidentially, in confidence, notify the employee of that performance problem and inquire whether the problem is related to this disability. If the employee responds affirmatively, the contractor shall, not may, shall inquire whether the employee needs a reasonable accommodation. This is really affirmative action at its most affirmative, you know, positive, proactive. It is really very proactive. And it really it goes beyond what the ADA requires of non-government contractors. And to my mind is somewhat counterintuitive. Again, the intuitive response is to remain focused on the performance problem and not to make inquiries into whether the performance deficiency is related to the known disability. Nonetheless, this is there, it's been there, uh, and I'm not so sure that it is being com you know, com complied with to a significant degree, but it's been there and continues to exist and it's important that you know it and consider it when you have someone with a known disability that has a performance problem because this is your obligation, has been, and continues to be. Uh, going back to reasonable accommodation, again, it's nothing new. It's, it exists under the ADA, it is under the Rehab Act, other than this little section I just read under, the, under, under VEBRA and Rehab, um, the standards are the same, undue hardship, reasonable accommodation, et cetera. Uh, it is important to note the second bullet that electronic or online application systems, of course, you know, the regulations weren't updated since the 70s, we're in a new world. They must be structured so that qualified individuals with disabilities are provided equal employment opportunity to apply. So that if you have these electronic systems, you have to consider uh, those people who may be sight impaired or tactically impaired, uh, nonetheless, to be able to apply for employment. Oh, and I pointed out um, there is a resource that may be very helpful to you. It's called the Job Accommodation Network. Um, you, you see the uh, web address at the top. Um, it's provided by the United States Department of Labor, Office of Disability Employment Policy, again, ODEP, the one that we talked about in the first start of the program, in collaboration with the West, with West, West Virginia University. And it's a resource uh, for both employees and employers, for individuals. You see the top for employers, for individuals, for others, library, accommodation search, so if you click on for employers, you come up with, again, for private businesses, you click on private businesses, and it takes you down to the various resources, and it says uh, Jan provides free consulting services for all employers, regardless of the size of your workforce. It includes one-on-one -on -one consultation about all aspects of job accommodations, including the process, ideas, vendors, referrals to other sources, you can make those requests by telephone. You can make the request by email. There are online tools such as SOAR, the Searchable Online Accommodation Resource. If you, if you click on that, there you come up with 15 major health conditions listed therein from alphabetically from arthritis to wheelchair use. And each one then gives you a sub-discussion about what people kind of what accommodations may be needed or asked for for people that have those conditions. You can go to Jan on Demand and can submit an online inquiry. Again, this is all free service. There's a library, the Employer Practical Guide to Reasonable Accommodation under the ADA. You can download and print that document. There are certain publications you can click on accommodation ideas. There are, and I, if you click on accommodation ideas that's at the bottom under publications, um, you get dozens of, of medical conditions, disability conditions, all in alphabetical order. The, the first one, SOAR, had 15 major health conditions. This has dozens of them. Um, and I just yesterday clicked on albinism, uh, people who are albinos. 
And, and there were literally five pages of information about both the condition along with multiple accommodation suggestions. Because sometimes when you're dealing with disabilities, the, both the employee and the employer have to put their heads together to determine what, will, what accommodations can, what reasonable accommodations can be made so that the employee can um, continue to do the job or can do the job um, efficiently and appropriately can perform the, the um, essential functions of the job. So the job, the job accommodation and, uh, network is, is very helpful, and I uh, encourage you to, uh, when you have uh, questions about how to make an accommodation, and again, also the other important word is interactive process. I see so many ADA, and not so much rehab cases, but so many ADA cases where um, employers get caught up in just failing to properly go through the interactive process. Engage the employee. Find out what their needs are. Put, try to put your heads together. See if you can come up with a reasonable accommodation. It's not always possible. There are times when you can't come up with a reasonable accommodation um, that would allow the person to perform the essential functions of the job. Of course, they have to be able to perform the essential functions of the job with the accommodation. It's not always possible, but it's important for the employer to engage in the interactive process because too many cases I see it, the, the, the employers fall down in, in just in that, in that in having that discussion, having that interactive dialogue. External dissemination of policy outreach and positive recruitment. Um, the employer, the contractor must send written notification of the company policy on affirmative action to all subcontractors requesting appropriate action on their part. Uh, in prior iterations of the regulations, uh, this was a suggested suggested option. It is no longer a suggested option. It is required. You should be doing that. You should be keeping those records. Keep a file on notice to your subcontractor, reminding them of your obligation to be in affirmative action and if they're also applicable subcontractors, reminding them of their obligations to be affirmative action employers. On an annual basis, you shall review and evaluate the effectiveness of the outreach and recruitment efforts taken over the past 12 months. Again, this is mom and apple pie. Um, what outreach have you engaged in? What recruitment efforts have you engaged in? How have you reached out to the minority, to the, minority, the, the disabled community? What advocacy groups have you have you reached out to uh, in, a, in an effort to um, uh, engage in recruitment efforts? What, what schools uh, have you perhaps um, tried to recruit at? Um, uh, using Gallaudet Debt as an example for the hearing impaired in DC, uh, using that as a recruitment resource. Um, unfortunately, every medical condition, I shouldn't say, but many, the majority of medical conditions have advocacy groups, unfortunately or unfortunately. Um, they have advocacy groups when you have an opening for, for a position. Uh, there's no reason you can't reach out to those advocacy groups and say, I have an opening in accounting. I have an opening in human resources. Um, please send us your candidates if you have any candidates. You don't have to hire from those resources, but it's all about outreach, casting the wider net. What recruitment efforts can you undertake? What worked? What didn't work? So you're going to review and evaluate what worked, what didn't work. And if not, consider alternative approaches, and Dean will talk about some of those alternative approaches shortly. And then, of course, you must keep those records on external dissemination, outreach, and positive recruitment for three years. And as, P as Peter just mentioned, you clearly have this obligation to engage in outreach and recruitment. So what do you, exactly do you do? Who do you engage in outreach with? Uh, who is going to assist you with recruitment? Well, fortunately now, this technology era that we're in, there's a lot of resources that are publicized and readily available to you should you just jump on the computer and do a Google search. Uh, and more specifically, the OSCCP's website, the uh, Office of Disability Employment Policy website, all provide resources to you. So as we did and showed you the resources available for protected veterans, there's a similar recruiting and hiring page for qualified individuals with disabilities. Uh, and as you'll see uh, on the slide, there's a number of different uh, 
website that you can go to the American Job Center, uh, connects businesses with individuals seeking employment through local American Job Center. So you basically have a national uh, network that you're able to uh, post your uh, open positions for, and the individuals in the locales in which they are are able to search to find out if you have openings where they are located. Other resources that are available, the career opportunities for students with disabilities. College students coming out of, uh, coming out of college are looking for jobs, and you may very well be an employer that are looking for uh, uh, new recruits, entry-level positions uh, that are kids coming out of college. This is a great resource here available, a National Professional Association that has a national online job posting and college student resume database system for students with disabilities that can connect you with them. So if you think about what your hiring needs are, and if you have entry-level positions where you're looking to get college kids to, um, uh, to, um, to apply for positions, this is a great resource to, to connect with. Uh, other websites that are available, the disabled person provides tips for recruiting individuals with disabilities. Disability.gov does the same, the federal website with thousands of resources for employers. Uh, they have a specifically an employment page which you're able to go to and it provides you information again on what are reasonable accommodations uh, and other job support uh, resources. Uh, you're going to see in the next slide, EARN, Employer Assistance and Resource Network, which provides free technical assistance to employers seeking to recruit, hire, and retain individuals with disabilities. Uh, there's a National Federation for the Blind. I mentioned before about the need potentially to have your equal opportunities law poster put in Braille. Well, this organization will allow you uh, and assist you in converting your poster into Braille. Uh, and it will probably also uh, advise you of latest assistant technologies that are available that would assist you in hiring a blind person to work, be a part of your workforce. Uh, another uh, website, it's not part of the screen, but it's, it's offered uh, in, in this list that, uh, uh, that you have the website to, the, the, the link to. The National Telecommuting Institute helps fill jobs for companies and federal agencies they want to find qualified home-based individuals with disabilities who can serve and do customer service. So depending again on your uh, business that the, your company is a part of, if you have customer service needs, this is a great resource to be able to reach out to and find people who, can who need to and can telecommute and they'll be able to do the job for you. So there are tremendous resources available for you that's offered by the OSCCP. Now, Peter mentioned at the start of our program that um, while most of us think of October as National uh, Breast Car Cancer Awareness Month, it's actually uh, also attributed to National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Uh, and the government is geared up and provides information to you, makes it readily available to celebrate and raise awareness uh, about the uh, employment opportunities and issues facing those who are disabled. As Peter mentioned, expect, employ, empower. What you can do is the present motto and poster that's available for employers to post. This is obviously the end of October, but it's something that you should be thinking about going forward um, in terms of uh, every October, it's National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and you can engage your workforce in celebrating that and bringing attention to it. Now, also on this website, it and I'm, are, sure, I'm sure you can do that in November and December. And that's January. true. <laughs> that is true. There's nothing that stops you from doing that. Uh, there are also uh, on the the, uh, the link that we provided here on this slide uh, resources that are available to you. Peter mentioned about the different weeks of the uh, uh, each week there being different information provided during the course of the month. On that first week, the second slide provide you information regarding business strategies that work. And within this document itself, you can develop, it assists you in developing strategies for building an inclusive business culture, for hiring, providing uh, hiring strategies. Uh, it, it helps you to uh, provide strategies for making reasonable accommodate, to defining reasonable accommodation procedures, for engaging in outreach uh, and recruitment, 
Uh, it also gives you strategies for internal and external communications as well as the use of technology. So the resources are incredible. Uh, that last slide, Ask Earn Org, uh, is what I just made reference to before uh, in my previous slide, the Employer Assistance and Resource Net Network. Uh, there are incredible resources that are available to you, and you should reach out uh, and uh, uh, get your fingers dirty finding out what information is available to you uh, because this is going to go a long way towards you then being able to document just exactly what your efforts are. And by the way, as Peter likes to say, you know, just looking on the website and looking at these different uh, links, the different organizations that are available to you, that's a form of affirmative action. It's taking steps, and you should be documenting your efforts. That on such and such date, we went and we looked at these resources, and we tried to figure out what to do. And the more that you're able to do and document it, then the better position you are in should you be subject to an audit. And, and this program we're doing today is a form of affirmative action. It's a training session of affirmative action. You should document the fact that you attended this webinar. That is affirmative action. Now, uh, I also click just continuing further, but just because of time, we'll be brief. Ideas for employers and employees. This, again, is celebrating uh, the National Disability Employment Awareness Month. So you can do it th this month or next month or the month after that, as Peter indicated, or you can set yourself up for a month down the road. But one of the things that I liked about it was whether you're doing it now or doing it at some point in time, it's, again, a great resource for you, giving you ideas about things you can do. It talks about reviewing policies, establishing uh, employee resource groups, creating a display such as that poster that we had on the previous slide. Uh, all resources available to you, you can pick and choose what you do, uh, and it brings attention to the importance of hiring individuals with disabilities. Now, we just talked about uh, the external dissemination of your policy and your outreach efforts. The government also requires you to have internal dissemination of your policy, and the policy being the equal opportunity policy, equal employment opportunity policy which should effectively say that you're going to engage in non-discrimination and affirmative action of, uh, as it relates to individuals with disabilities. A couple of important points to note. Uh, you are now required to make sure that that policy is included within your policy manual. Most of you most likely have already done that. Uh, but if not, it needs to be included. Uh, if you are a unionized workforce, uh, you need to be notifying your union of that policy. Uh, and uh, what you also need to be doing uh, is indicating within the policy, so there may be need for modifications of policy, that your top executive, you know, the EEO of the company, the president of the company, supports the program, uh, and you need to ensure also that it's accessible to, to applicants. As I mentioned before, you're going to want to have on your career web page, uh, if you're doing it, you have a career site online, a link to both that equal opportunity policy as well as your equal employment opportunity policy. Now, Peter stole my thunder. I was so excited and, and wanted to be able to use the Mayor Koch scenario of, hey, how am I doing? <laughs> uh, uh, but basically, the audit and reporting system is putting a system in place so that while you're doing all this work that we've been talking about, meeting all these different obligations, that you're measuring it, you're, you're tracking it, you're documenting it. This has always been a requirement, having an audit and reporting system, having that in place. Uh, but there's more teeth into it now, because while it's always been required, uh, the government is not satisfied that contractors have done a good job of actually auditing and reporting their systems. So now the very last bullet talks about documenting this obligation. So you need to be able to document your efforts to measure the effectiveness of your programs, to indicate the need for remedial action. I note that fourth bullet down, determining whether known disabled individuals have had the opportunity to participate in all company-sponsored educational training, recreational, social activities. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in our program, we don't know how that's going to play out, but that, is, is, that's, that puts an incredible burden on you, the employer, to be able to track how those people who have self-identified themselves as being disabled whether they're actually participating in these programs and trainings and social activities that you have. So you need to be mindful uh, of that. And this is the uh, documentation that you're going to be needing to keep for two years so that if you are subject to an audit, the OCCP can come back and say, okay, we want to take a look and see how it's, uh, where you're at with that. Uh, 
uh, as I'm sure you all know, you need to have official responsible uh, affirmative action administrator who is the face of the organization as far as affirmative action is concerned. Uh, and the regulations provide that that person has to be identified on all internal and external communications so that there's a, a face, a name associated with the program so that people can, in the, within the company can reach out to and seek assistance. And what's important to note here is that the affirmative action administrator must have the support of senior management. If you're a government contractor, senior management must embrace the affirmative action and support the affirmative action administrator. And now more so than ever, you need to have staffing to implement these programs. And we'll see how that plays out because certainly there's a lot more documentation obligations that exist today than did a year ago. Um, and so there's probably going to be at times needs to, for some pushing within, the, within your companies to say we need more resources. Now, another obligation you have uh, and you've had in the past, but it's important for us to, to make note of, is to make sure that you're training your personnel who are specifically involved in recruiting, screening, selecting, promoting, disciplining your employees. And the purpose is to ensure, again, non-discrimination and affirmative action. We want to make sure that uh, while it may not be natural uh, to hire someone who's different from us, we need to be comfortable with the idea of hiring people who may be different from us uh, but yet have the, the best qualifications for the position. So when Peter talked about casting a wider net, you can uh, do a, your organization a favor by training your personnel to, and talk about the importance of casting that wider net, attracting a greater pool of candidates, including individuals with disabilities, that's going to go a long way to changing the makeup of your workforce. All right, and we're almost at the end here. Utilization goals, this is important, this is new. Um, you know, for the first time, the OCCP has said, we want you to start measuring uh, how you're doing. Uh, and they've actually established a utilization goal of 7% for the employment of qualified individuals with disabilities within each job group. If we have AAPs, you have minorities and women, you have job groups set up. It should be the same job groups. And um, instead of a, a, a moving uh, target for minorities and women that changes every year based on availability analyses, this is a set 7% based on national data. They set it. They've set it. It's 7% with each group. If you have 100 or less employees, you can do it for the entire workforce, but it's a 7% uh, uh, goal, utilization goal by job group. It's not a rigid or inflexible quota which must be met, nor does it be considered a ceiling or a floor, and quotas are expressly forbidden. Uh, that language is, is also found um, in both in VEBRA and the 11246 regs. Uh, it's, it's considered to be a benchmark, a goal, an objective, uh, again, not a quota. Um, you know, if you're under 7%, then again, it's what, you know, you, you, you're collecting the data, you're analyzing the data, then the content, and if you're under 7 if you're over 7%, you can pat yourself on the back, I made my, I made my number. But if you're under 7%, then you must make, take, take steps to determine whether there are impediments, are there problem areas, is there a reason you're under 7%? and develop action-oriented programs, casting the wider net, designed to get to 7%. So you have a goal, you have a target, you have a benchmark to, to get to. Patricia Shu recently stated, failure to hit the benchmark or goal is not a violation, failure to try is a violation. So, you know, this is gonna be key. We now have a 7% goal, you have, a, you have a job group analysis, you know percentage of minorities and women, uh, now you know the percentage of disabled from your self-ID. And if someone doesn't self-ID but you know they're disabled um, by, by a visual uh, survey, you can consider them a disabled person and count them towards a 7%. Because sometimes people choose not to self-identify. It is voluntary. But if you're aware that they have a disability, you're entitled to count them. Uh, finally, um, the availability of the Affirmative Action Program um, so there's nothing new here. The full affirmative program, absent the data metrics. So you don't have to give them the applicant numbers. You don't have to give them the, the job group data for the numbers of disabled employees. Uh, but the rest of the verbiage of what you're doing, your outreach programs uh, and the like, uh, how you train people, uh, how you get uh, senior management support, 
that a full affirmative action program shall be available to any employee or applicant upon request and the location and hours during which the program uh, may be obtained shall be posted at each establishment. So uh, we're exactly at two o'clock. I've just run through some slides. I'll actually run right back to them. Uh, we do have client advisories, uh, different forms of information to keep you up to date. If you're not on our present mailing list, let us know to ensure that we can get you on there. We have a number of award-winning outstanding blogs where our uh, colleagues are constantly promoting uh, 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 publishing updated news uh, with, with regard to the different industries in which we counsel employers. So make sure you get yourself on those blogs. Well, we very much appreciate your time today. I think we're out of the opportunity for questions in terms of time, but if you have questions, we'd be more than happy to respond to them by email. So thank you very much for your attention today. We very much appreciate it. Thank you to everyone. Peter and Dean, we certainly appreciate your presentation this afternoon, um, and we certainly appreciate the participation of everybody who has been on the webinar today. Um, as Dean just mentioned, um, you are welcome to submit questions directly to our presenters um, now that the webinar has concluded, and we will leave the contact information on the screen for just a moment. Questions that were asked this afternoon will also be addressed uh, via email by our presenters in the coming few business days. Um, and also as a reminder, uh, in approximately two to three business days, we will communicate the availability of the recording and access to the PowerPoint materials for this presentation. And at this time, we will conclude the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you.